Welcome to We Choose to Thrive. This is our interview series with women who have decided to rise above the abuse, no matter what kind of abuse it was, of their past, and to live rich, full lives. We hope you will enjoy our interview series. Alexis Moore, thank you so much for joining us for our We Choose to Thrive series. It's such a pleasure to have you. Oh, my pleasure, Becky, as always, as, as I've been singing along. If you're alive, you better choose to thrive. So I was so <laughs> excited to participate. Thank you. Ah, wonderful. So for the, for the benefit of our listeners, can you share a, a little bit about your story, your backstory, not, not, not like in extreme detail because this is a video for the book. Yeah, that's um, probably a soap opera, yeah. Too many, <laughs> too many episodes, yeah. Give us a little bit of your background of sure. what happened for you. Okay, sure. My pleasure. Uh, growing up, uh, unfortunately, I was the, uh, in and out of the uh, child custody situation, so the courts are all I remember. So I had broken home syndrome thing, mom and dad fighting over custody and, um, you know, who was going to do what, and it was just in and out of the court. So all I really remember from the time I was small was that sort of turmoil where my stomach would hurt so literally bad that I was worried about, you know, am I going to my dad's this weekend? Am I going to court? And my voice wasn't being heard. And I'm talking, I was as young as second grade, having teachers ask me why I was having tummy ache and that sort of thing. So I was broke, you know, broken home deal, and I totally felt unheard and um, hated the courts. And all I remember it as a kid was my tap tap with my shoes hitting the, uh, you know, the court steps and all. I mean, I just remember all these memories and, and so on. And then, unfortunately, too, at the house, um, I grew up in a very abusive household. There's a lot of yelling, a lot of screaming, and a lot of turmoil. So I didn't really have that safe refuge growing up. And I grew up really fast. Uh, there were instances of child molest and a lot of neglect and abuse. And all of that took its toll on me, but I never really realized how much so in, until I got into adulthood. I was 16 when I left high school and I started college right away. So I didn't fall into drugs and alcohol or anything. And thank goodness is all I say. I, I just kept my study, my focus. But uh, needless to say, it impaired my ability to cope well with relationships with people, uh, meaning I was an easy target to get bullied at school. So I had that, and then when I later became employed, which was right off, I mean, I was 15, 16, uh, working and earning a living and paying my car insurance and going to school and all these things, and I really hadn't matured, you know, I didn't understand, wow, not only was there, you know, so much more going on out there that I hadn't ever known besides the abuse and what have you, it was just a really interesting situation. So I was employed like an adult experiencing adult things but not prepared for you know harassment at the workplace which I did unfortunately endure so I had some sexual harassment in the workplace and I chose a very <laughs> unique profession I was a female firefighter very cool. proud yeah I was the first woman here in my hometown and then I was really gung-ho about it but it was early 90s and I had no idea you know being the first woman and then going to work in this very uh, much male-dominated profession everywhere else I was not prepared and I didn't understand that until I actually experienced some abuse in that regard. And then, um, boy, my life was devastated. I just didn't have the support system. I didn't know what to do. Uh, there wasn't the online community that there is now. Uh, so subsequently, that kind of a nutshell is my life. And then um, fire department, that didn't work out. And unfortunately, it was a work comp situation, but I never spoke out about the injuries I sustained. And I never got full attention for what I endured. Because, again, there was this little person inside of me who just thought, well, that's normal. You know, these things go on. Our, our ability to understand those things is, is when we've come up in a family of abuse, it's, yeah. we don't have the self-worth and the understanding that, that those things are not the right way. That's correct. But, again, we can't change time. I'm not blaming anyone <laughs> or anything. Uh, that makes me the great advocate I am today and this amazing attorney and this happy ending be so powerful is, if but for all these experiences, so emotional abuse and growing up in the courts and physical abuse and the um, you know child molestation and all these things that I endured, I wouldn't be this amazing human being I am now to say you can choose to thrive and you can kick ass and be very <laughs> successful and really do some amazing things. But it, you have to follow your path and your journey, and sometimes it sucks, you know. And in my case, it it affected my adult life so that I chose the wrong partner. And, you know, when you do these things, I made that choice to get into a relationship with someone I probably never should have been in the relationship with. 
And I didn't realize, though, how it would impact my life now and be so powerful and so amazing. At the time, I saw, you know, domestic violence and emotional abuse and was, you know, living what I considered like my childhood, but now as an adult, and that became the normal. Mm -hmm. So finally, it was so bad that I had left or tried to leave rather um, so many times like other people do. An abusive relationship, you leave and then you're stalked or you feel ashamed. You know, they're calling you and they call your relatives and they bother people and it makes you feel bad that you're trying to get rid of this problem or to solve it and not be abused. So I always returned home. Even after calling the police, you know, I had many instances where the sheriff would leave the home and then he would turn back and abuse me more. So, right. right. So rather than it be, and it's very typical, all these things happen and it's no blaming the sheriff's office or anyone either. It's just, it wasn't easy to leave. But finally what happened for me is I was face down on the floor and it was, I think I hear, I killed her. I heard him actually saying those words. I think I killed her. And that's when this huge, I mean, it was just for me face down on the floor and I think I killed her. Somehow, some way I got up, rose to my feet got to the car with just my purse and my blue jog suit and got out in the car and with him literally with his head and his whole body halfway in the car, he was trying to strangle me and keep me from leaving the home. But I drove away and never came back. And I mean, it was, there's a lot more involved, but that's what it took. Literally me hearing those words though, Becky, and for others, I hope it's not ever this position. I hope you can reach out and do something besides wait to be an attempt. Well, before that happens. Yeah. Yes. But it and took that. Yeah. yeah, and for you, it was, it didn't end there, even though you never went back, it didn't end there. And I, no. because I know you and, and know your yeah. story. And so you ran into that same abuser being the cyber stalker, which, which wreaked havoc on your life as well. That's right. So I physically separated and was willing to leave back, I mean, everything. So two precious dogs, all my clothes, a home that Lot would say is so beautiful and amazing. I mean, all these things your whole life. I fled it thinking, well, I'll be damned. This is it. This is okay. I'm going to live. This is the choice I'm making. And from here going forward, I'm going to start over and I'll be free from abuse. And it wasn't maybe just two to three weeks later, I had financial devastation and it wasn't at my own doing. It was, I wasn't able to use my credit cards at the gas station. And I thought, what the hell is going on? You know, what is this uh, C cashier BS and all of that? Well, it turned out that this particular perpetrator was not committing identity theft, but it actually accessed my banking and all of that, knowing my social security number, my mother's maiden name, you know, all these things, it's, you're just doomed. And not knowing that this was a potential factor or something I would face, there was no preparing for it. I mean, I, I, like I say, I was on the face, you know, face down saying, okay, this person thinks you just killed me. Now I'm on the run and I wasn't prepared for what was going to happen next. And yes, it, now it's called cyber stalking. But back then, it was just this crazy, you know, reporting something like that to law enforcement. Well, lady, they don't know anything about what that is. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm saying, hey, well, he didn't steal your money or the perpetrator. They'd say, let me get this straight. You know, and their eyes are rolling and they're looking at me like I'm wasting their time. And in essence, I probably was. I mean, let's face it, it wasn't legislatively known. The conduct was the first of its kind. So I'm sitting there, and again, I, I look at things now a lot more objectively. Yes, I was pissed, and I didn't feel like I was wasting their time. I wanted to call, <laughs> call. But today, understanding it 13 years later, you have a much more uh, clear a view. Mm -hmm. But all I can say is yes. So this individual had all of my personal information and was able to pay bills in this instance ahead of time, so auto pay. And of course, I was not you know, unlimited means, so it overdrew my account. So in that case, that's why my ATM card wouldn't work. And then it so happened that he was able to cancel all of my credit cards by simply sending in a fax request with my name on it, my social security number, please close this account. And then later it was, please change this address. Well, again, it wasn't identity theft because his purpose or this predator's purpose was not financial gain. It was to control me, you know, harass, manipulate, annoy, and mm -hmm. control. You know, I had left him physically. So now... I'm going to get you. And he did for quite some time. It almost took two years. But I can say that along the way, you know, I, I made a vow. I can say this 100%. I made this vow. I made it this far. And I'll be damned if I make it further that I won't become an attorney and be able to be that advocate I so wished that I, I would have had back then. Right. I had lawyers quitting on me. Law enforcement said I was crazy. Please don't report anymore. And at the same time, I was being physically stalked. So I was being followed by private investigators that he hired, and he had actually rented cars in the in the uh, 
town rental you know, car agency, I was smart enough to figure these things out on my own. And like I say, this is all part of the upcoming book too, Surviving a Cyber Stalker. I'm sharing how I overcame and how I help others to this day. But again, it took all of my wherewithal, became a full-time job, but I advocated my, my way, um, self-advocating, you know, meaning me by myself, uh, just had to do what I had to do to overcome. Well, That's was, amazing. You you are such a prime example of the spirit that it takes to be able to come to that place that we, it's a choice. Yeah. And it, it's a very definite choice. Sure. And so from this conversation, we, I see that you have made a choice. Yeah. And so tell about making that choice and the point that you had to come to to make the choice where you, and explain where you are now. Oh yeah, because it was it was you know everything wasn't peaches and roses and all these things and you know the happy ending did take a lot of effort. So I hit rock bottom. It was 2006 and these episodes began in 2004. So I remember it clearly. Uh, my grandmother was my advocate and um, God bless her, she was really really strong and I figured hey if she's 81 and can fight back so can I. But it just so happened she was dying of cancer now. And needless to say, it was January of 06, and I lost her in that following July. So mm -hmm. I knew time was coming near, and she had hospice care. Now she was homebound and everything else. It was a real just devastating time. I couldn't get any help. So my lawyers quit on me. I was literally going to court getting laughed at, but for the fact I had confidence and courage and could stand there, you know, it just over and over I wasn't getting anywhere. Um, you know, I was without funds except for the money I borrowed from my grandmother and I paid her back and it was just like I say, it was just so much going on. I literally just gave up. I lost my job because I was stalked in the workplace and the employer doesn't want that. You know, and I, I understand their at the time I am like, what in the heck, you know, but needless to say, there's laws and protections today that didn't exist back then. But I had everything go wrong. You know, I had no ability to get a job. I had all my bank accounts and credit and everything going down the tubes. And this last ditch effort to get to January of 06, I had paid in cash advance, just all my all cash money so that the landlord wouldn't run my credit to, you know, have a safety net so I wouldn't have it on my credit report for this predator to access where I was moving to. So I thought I was pretty shrewd. And I was going to maybe get a few months of time, you know, some peace or what have you, and just kind of square things away. But it didn't, it wasn't the case that I was found almost immediately. And I paid to live in this dump, you know, and the heat didn't work. I was freezing my tail off. I was literally sleeping in a stocking cap and I could see my breath. And I am telling you, it was such a miserable life. And my grandma was dying. I mean, I had just hit that point where I said, what in the hell? And I think, it was, you know, I left the district attorney's office and I believe that drive to my house, I kind of said, you know what, I can't take this anymore. And I was kind of running the circle through my mind. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I decided to take my own life. I, I literally believe it was just this, you know, you're just playing the same record and you're saying to yourself, I just don't want to keep going. I don't want right. to. Right. I get that. Yeah, many, of, so, many of us can relate to that. Yeah. And um, I smile because thank God I had a tenacious friend at the time and it was a business acquaintance who I just shared a little bit of my story with saying, gosh, I'm experiencing the stalking and the cyber abuse. And I didn't call it then. It was, I'm being stalked electronically. And of course, again, who the hell wants to hear these stories? But he felt there was something off. He tried to call me and it was maybe, I don't know, nine o'clock at night. And it was raining and he easily could have just like he was saying, I had this thing inside of me that says I'm going to go over to your home and see what's going on. But he wanted to roll back in bed like we all do, like, oh, you know, I don't know her very well and this is crazy. But then again, you know, we all have angels. We all believe in something. Or if you don't, you know, just in my world, I do. And it just so happens that I'm sitting there with this bottle of vodka and I've got these pills and I'm about to do what I think is make my life so much better and just end this. Mm -hmm. And this person was relentless. They would not go away. And I mean, I cursed at this person. I said, get the hell out of here. You know, I don't want you here. And uh, boy, I'll tell you what got me though is when he's taking the screen door off my uh, bedroom window and saying, I'm coming in with or without you or your help or whatever. And I said, oh boy, I'll let you in. So I let him in. And um, it wasn't anything that he said or did, Becky. And for those out there that are potentially going to save someone's life from suicide, it was just the fact this human being he sat was there. He was there. And he sat next to me for maybe 20 minutes and I got to the point where we were laughing so hard and it was me laughing at myself saying all this, all this in your life to end it for this. 
and I literally said, what in the hell am I doing? And that's, we just started laughing. And this person, I don't think was laughing per se, but it was a way I have kind of a comedic side that uh, my clients can tell. I just do. I've made light of a lot of things and I like to joke and dance around. So I'm sitting there on the couch and I said, well, what the hell am I going to let this, this is going to be my dying day in this dump apartment that smells like cigarette smoke <laughs> with my breath, you know, it's so cold. We can see our breath. This is not how I'm going to go out. I'm going to go out in style. And it was just kind of one of these, I'll be damned moments. And so the bottle was pushed aside, the pills. And um, at just at that moment, I said, you know what, here I am and I'm going to fight. I want to get back in the game and um, fight for my life. And I did. So I had vowed to become an attorney back in November of 04. I had a dreadful experience with a lawyer, gave her $10,000. You know, she knew I was a domestic violence victim. Well, rather than her calling me, the paralegal did. At the, I'm talking 5.30 at night before a hearing to say, we're sorry, but so-and-so can't represent you. She has a young child and she's in fear for her life. But she knew all along I was a domestic abuse victim. I mean, I'm beat up. It's hard to hide these injuries and it's hard to hide the circumstance. And anyhow, I just made a vow. So from that moment forward, I was going to become an attorney. I didn't know how. I didn't know if it was possible. How or when or where yeah. or what. <laughs> or how or, you know, if, if all this was just okay, okay, I hope so. But meanwhile, um, that was the vow I made. So that Jul the January 06 just kind of reaffirmed that, you know, you've got something more to do here. Mm -hmm. And it's on your plate. There's and more to life than this. That's right. And you can choose to thrive. And I'll be damned I did. I mean, it was cold as hell. I hated this place I was in, but it taught me today to be so grateful for food in my refrigerator, for a heater that works and for these things. And I, I literally believe if I didn't have all of those experiences leading up to this moment, I wouldn't understand anything. I wouldn't be the advocate I am. I wouldn't be the human being I am. So I'm grateful. And that's a huge part of it and wanting to thrive. So my mm -hmm. life was, I want to live. And I feel that way today. You know, we have ups and downs. We have triggers. We know, you know, as survivors, there's always something. But you do have a choice. We do. So what would you say to somebody that's just starting, that's gone through much of what you went through or even pieces of what you went through? Sure. Who just realizes, boy, I'm not happy. I'm not living life full. And they're starting to wake up to the fact that they need, there's action that needs to be taken on their own part to, yeah. to stand, to not stand in their story, but on their story, what okay. would you say to them? I would say first off, hands down, don't compare yourself to anyone. Because I have this happen all the time. Someone says, well, Alexis, I don't know if I can do what you did. Well, you know what, you're not me. So we're gonna, your journey is your own. And when someone comes to me and they are looking for this sort of advice, the first thing I say is stop the presses, figure out what matters to you most. And if it's family relationships that matter to you or your friends or your job, there's got to be something that matters and focus in on that. And if there's weak links, you're only as strong as your weakest link. So in my case, I had a very weak link. It was my grandmother. She was dying of cancer. Mm -hmm. And this person knew that he was able to manipulate me by that relationship very much so. But so the irony is, even though I lost her and I am always saying how much I miss her, I knew that was a weakness. And the fact that she was gone that July only made it more powerful and, and my steps going forward even easier because I was honoring her legacy and I didn't have to worry so much. Like, in other words, you're just going to see this beautiful transformation, but you have to choose mm -hmm. and you cannot compare yourself to anyone else. And it may not be pretty. And what I mean by that is I have a very small circle. So I don't have this huge, um, you know, Walton family, like I'm a child of the 70s. So there isn't eight is enough in my life. I mean, it's just I have very small circle of friends that I trust. That so you're very selective about who your friends are, yes, too. Yeah. I protect myself. So what I mean by that is everything is an audition in life. That's what I like to tell people. When someone enters your space, they're auditioning to have a spot in your play or in your life. That's how I like to use this analogy. And if you don't like what you're seeing, that is a, a time for you to step back and say, you know what, there may be something off here. And mm -hmm. as a survivor, we all have a, a little bit of a wall anyway, but it's real important that that inside, you know, that little bell or whistle, your gut feeling as a woman, intuition, all these things, let that work for you. And I like my analysis with this audition, uh, much like when we first met, you didn't know me, I didn't know you. You can really see a lot if you just kind of step back and let those people do and say, 
and you let them audition and, and earn that place in your life. True. Very true. And push back and don't expect, and being, being most popular um, also is another message. You, you, you may not be successful if you are most popular. And that's something I've realized. Like the fact that I have a smaller core of, of um, individuals around me, that means I don't have anybody to please or to wait on or to dote on or to um, worry about their opinion. It's about me being successful and me ex achieving. And sometimes it's selfish sounding, but what it is, you're, you're, you're helping yourself so you can propel forward. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the relationships I've seen with other survivors is uh, very codependent. They're not trying to excel. They're not trying to go forward. In fact, they're looking for something to drag them down even. Where I was always looking for people by my side to either walk with me in my journey, journey or actually help me by saying, go get him a Lexus or that sort of thing. Right. I've, never, I've never felt good in a relationship of any kind if I'm having to help someone unless I'm a leader or employer or something. But <laughs> you get what I'm saying. There, so there's right. figures and things, and, and uh, it's a matter of paying attention to that inner core and making your circle strong and tight. That would be my advice. And not comparing yourself to anyone. Even That's in, right. Even in law school, I was not successful. I was on academic probation. I didn't like it in school. And I can tell you, but I passed the bar the first time. And that's an accomplishment major. It is. Yes. It is. Thumbs up. I mean, California bar <laughs> is very hard. And I can say this to you, but again, I wasn't so much interested in my grades in law school. The bigger picture has always been my life. And the bigger picture was passing that bar, just like it was for me to overcome the cyber abuse, you know, cyber stalking um, and the stalking. I mean, there's, you put a focus on it and you've got to just stick to it. Mm -hmm. And you can't feel sorry for yourself or you're going to be stuck back in that cycle and you won't be thriving. And that's what I say to choose to thrive. If, you if it is to be, it's up to me. That's right. Yeah. It's beautiful. Right. And if right. you are alive, choose to thrive. And that's been, um, mm -hmm. that's it. I mean, there's no other words just to really close your eyes and say it. Like if you're alive and you do not have just the last breath, but this is a life every day and you haven't been given that, um, that lethal diagnosis of cancer or what have you, even then you have a choice, but all I'm getting at is you have to choose to thrive. Very it is beautiful. It's a choice, yeah, for sure. Wow. Very beautiful words and, and quite a message out there that, and the beauty of it is the strength that you show and your drive to make sure that, that you provide the kind of guidance in your law firm for those that have gone through some of the stuff that you had to go through without the help. That's right. There wasn't an Alexis Moore, so a lot of my um, focus has been reminding people when they actually get to phone me, you know, I lived it and I've been um, as a risk management consultant working with stalking and cyber abuse victims for 13 years. And I kind of remind them to keep people in check. You know, there was no Alexis Moore. I had attorneys failing on me, as I mentioned, just take my money and quit. Mm -hmm. I had law enforcement call me crazy. And there was no cyber stalking, cyber abuse known. I mean, we are talking nothing. And there wasn't the internet support groups like we choose to thrive and the woman I love and all these amazing. <laughs> we don't have, we didn't, the Alexis Moore generation, we didn't have all that. So oh, when that's someone, right. yeah, so when someone phones me and, and um, is in crisis or in a need, the first thing I like them to do is realize, well, you came to the right place. Now it's up to you to accept help. And I can't walk the journey for you, but I can be there by your side. So that's the sort of advocate I am. I'm looking for someone that wants to help themselves to take ownership, just like I did. I got into an abusive relationship. I made that choice. There were signs and there were things and I overlooked those and I haven't repeated that. Thank God. Right. And, right. You know, and um, all I've got to say though, is there is ownership for the person too. Uh, you've got to be willing to say, I want to help myself and close your eyes and really think deeply. Do you really want to accept help and help yourself? Because it's a, it's a self-advocacy role that anyone has to play as much as it is me helping you. You have to also want to take ownership and help yourself. Beautiful. Yeah. Very beautiful. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with We Choose to Thrive. Thank you. And, and your message is so va valuable and vital to the success of what we're, our attempts are right here is to, to show and to lead by example that we can choose to thrive and that life can be amazing. That's right. And yeah. you've got to choose it. So yeah. if you're watching <laughs> this video and you're saying, I want to do this, you can right now choose to thrive. And so if you're experiencing cyber abuse or stalking, you got to take that first step and pick up the phone too. 
Because wallowing good. in your misery isn't going to solve the problem. It never does, does it? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you for watching this We Choose to Thrive interview. If you are currently in an abusive situation, please seek help immediately. Our purpose in creating this book and video series is to form a sisterhood of support. Know that abuse is abuse no matter what kind it is. The stories in this We Choose to Thrive series are as many and varied as the people in it. If this resonates with you, we welcome you and invite you to join us. If you know someone who would benefit from hearing this interview, please feel free to share.